I'd like to now introduce the last session of day one entitled, I'm Post-Treatment, CRC Reality. In this session, we'll hear from three patients who are in, all in post-treatment and at various stages of post-treatment. Openly and honestly, these patients will share some of the physical, emotional, and practical challenges they faced and how they dealt with these challenges. Our patients will be joined by a nurse clinician as part of the session, who will also share her deep experiences in helping patients deal with some of the post-treatment issues and realities. I'm very excited about this uh, upcoming conversation. And as a reminder to everyone, please use the question, uh, question button to ask any questions that you might have as part of this session. This is an open dialogue. And also feel free to put your comments into the chat, which uh, we'll be running throughout most of the session as well. So I'd like to first introduce uh, the first three patients who will be speaking with us today um, in order of uh, in, in order the order of which they'll be speaking. First, uh, let me welcome uh, Javier uh, Debain who is a stage three colorectal cancer survivor and has been in remission for a year. His treatments have included chemotherapy, chemo radiation and other surgeries. After 18 months of uh, treatments, uh, thankfully he resumed his job in the financial services industry. Um, second uh, speaker is Ryan Player. Ryan is also a chartered professional accountant and can also in the financial service industry and continues to work in um, the accounting field post uh, post cancer. Uh, Ryan was diagnosed in December of 2019. We also welcome Hannah Cohen. Hannah is a patient and caregiving support specialist for colorectal cancer, uh, Canada, the, um, the host of the, this, uh, this conference. For 17 years prior, she worked with neurological and geriatric pop pop populations as a medical social worker. Hannah is a stage three colon cancer survivor and celebrated five years with no evidence of disease this past February. So welcome to our patients, and I'm going to introduce our nurse practitioner just before she speaks. Um, so Javier, please, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, sure, thank you so much. Um, so as you said, I had uh, rectal cancer um, diagnosed uh, two and a half years ago. Um, I had a series of treatments starting with chemotherapy, uh, radio, chemo radiation, and then surgery. Uh, two surgeries, and um, I've, uh, my last treatment was uh, June last year, and I've been in remission since, uh, so all good news, and um, I'm now uh, learning the post-treatment uh, life uh, with, uh, I think, you, you know, some physical limitations, and we can talk about that, uh, and also an uh, emotional uh, journey that uh, has been, uh, uh, you know, very... Um, um, roller coaster, I should say, and um, and happy to talk um, and um, joining the the panel today. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us, um, Ryan. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, my name is Ryan Player. I was diagnosed in December 2019 with stage four colorectal cancer that had spread to my liver, <clears throat> so I went through chemo, radiation, all that fun stuff, and had surgery in October of 2020. Unfortunately, picked up an infection after surgery, so ended up on life support, and all the that was about 40 days in the hospital, but eventually recovered and kind of relearned how to walk and everything, so I was cleared of cancer in January of 2021, and now I have returned to work getting used to keeping up with my two boys again that play lots of baseball and hockey. So that keeps me busy for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a rather marvelous recovery, having to learn to walk from being... Yeah, I kind of glossed over that part a little bit, but <laughs> it was yes. definitely lots of physio and 
as long as you do what the physiotherapist says, even though you don't want to sometimes, it makes it a lot easier for sure. Right. But that took well, about three, four weeks, I think, and then I was, I was fine. Hmm. Well, Ron, we'll look forward to hearing more about your story as we get into the conversation today. And last but certainly not least, um, I'd, I'd like to welcome Hannah Cohen, who is with Colorectal Cancer Canada, as I mentioned earlier. Hannah, I think you're a little bit further along your post-treatment journey. So you can see that we've got people at the beginning, people in the middle, and you're towards, uh, you're, you're well, uh, well on your way, so to speak. Yeah, hi, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> so as you mentioned, I'm actually, uh, it's now six years uh, NED for me, uh, no evidence of disease. Uh, I was diagnosed at the age of 38 uh, with um, stage three colon cancer, uh, no family history or anything. Um, at the time I had uh, two daughters, I still do, but they were four and six at the time. Um, and so, you know, that presented a whole bunch of challenges. So now six years later, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. I'm excited to share my story because uh, my life actually looks really nothing like it did. And um, really a lot of it uh, was influenced by this journey that I went through. So uh, really, really excited to be amongst all these wonderful people today. Thank you. All right, great. It must have been particularly difficult as a young mom to go through what you went through. Absolutely, um, but uh, I think we're all stronger for it. So um, again, sharing my story is is really uh, is really hopefully going to inspire others as well. Great, perfect. And I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Colleen Cuthbert, who is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary and the Cummings School of Medicine Department of Community Health Services. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cuthbert, for being with us. So I'd like to actually ask you to talk uh, about uh, some of the issues that you've certainly seen for people who are in post-treatment programs, and then we can get into a discussion about with everyone else and their, own, their experiences as well. Sure, great. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here today. And um, be with uh, this great panel of patients to talk about this. I actually, um, along with being in the uh, an assistant professor in the faculty of nursing, I also worked in uh, post treatment with post treatment colorectal cancer patients for uh, about five years. I ran a follow up clinic, so I uh, feel like I'm very kind of well aware of um, a lot of the issues that patients face. And also um, my program of research as a, a scientist is based in um, cancer survivorship. And I um, have a lot of, I've done a lot of work and research in the space of colorectal cancer post-treatment. So um, I feel like I, I know from a different side, not the patient perspective side, but the research and the clinical practice side. Um, I would say, um, and I'd love to hear from the other panel members if this experience rings true for you, but I would have to say there's kind of this bucket of common issues that colorectal cancer patients face in the post-treatment period that um, really doesn't, isn't always consistent for everybody and people go through these at, in different stages, but um, certainly changes to bowel, bowel um, Yes, someone's dog was having a moment. <laughs> yes, very much so. Um, um, so sorry, uh, that was my dog. Um, definitely he was agreeing with you. Sorry? He was agreeing with you. <laughs> Um, changes to bowels, um, which can, can be quite um, life impactful because it can be certainly um, can change the way people organize their day. Um, and so changes to bowels can be a, a, a big thing and a big impact, but not everybody experiences that. And um, we don't actually know uh, we can't really predict very well what patients are going to be more impacted by that long-term side effect. Um, persistent fatigue, we know from the literature and many of the studies that have been done, long-term fatigue is a problem that some patients face um, and have trouble managing. 
Um, brain fog, um, although this really tends to rebound, I would say in that kind of 18 to 24 month period, um, it doesn't seem to be as persistent, which I think is good news for a lot of people that are maybe in this initial phase and they're worried about whether or not this, they're going to feel foggy forever. Certainly emotional problems, especially things like fear of recurrence are um, high up there on the list of uh, things that we see reported in all of his studies. And I would say in, I saw in clinical practice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, adjusting to um, kind of living with this life as, as maybe somebody who identifies as having a chronic illness and that adjusting to that new normal, which I'd love to hear everybody talk about more, how, the, how they've done that. Peripheral neuropathy, sometimes financial difficulties if there's um, not that financial stability anymore, um, if people can't return to work. And then I, I really want to also highlight some of the problems that I would say are common but maybe not as easily talked about um, by a lot of patients. Uh, but we know from the literature and certainly, um, as I said, I experienced in my clinical practice that there are certain things that can be very impactful on health and quality of life as well. And so those are things like um, sexual health and changes to sexual functioning, um, post-treatment, emotional problems like anxiety and depression, although mental health, I think, is a lot more accepted now in um, kind of society. I think there's still some stigma around mental health. And then changes in relationships. So, um, and this, again, this may come from changes in sexual health or sexual function, but also just changes in personal relationships or friendships um, or family relationships um, can also be a, a toll and an adjustment that needs to be made in that post-treatment period. So I think I'll stop there. I have a lot more that I could say, but I want to hear from our other, uh, see it, see if this brings through. If, if we're setting the stage on what clearly is a complex whole landscape of issues. And so maybe I'll start with a really simple question, which is where you began, which is, you know, hearing from our panelists on how they had to reorganize their day. Everyone fundamentally has big lives. Everyone had been at work and life changed. So um, uh, Ryan, maybe we could start with you. How did your day change with your diagnosis? Yeah, I think the big thing for me was I've always liked to work early in the morning, get up, go, That, that's done. <laughs> it's definitely more of a, you have to kind of plan your day differently. So I, I try to eat smaller meals throughout the day. So I've kind of factored that into how I go about work. So I do, do go to work later than I normally would. And then kind of, and have a, we have, we call it a hybrid model, but I work from home for part of the day and then go to the office for the rest. And I found that's helped a lot because I can kind of structure things like eating. And cause if I were to have a normal breakfast, like I did before, that's not going to work out. So I have to kind of structure the day. So I'm eating smaller breakfasts, smaller meals. And then I work from home, probably go to the office around 1130 or so. And then I find the afternoons usually fine as far as handling any stomach or bowel issues, but it's definitely changed the way you go about daily things that probably took for granted before. That's for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now tell me, did you, have you shared um, your uh, personal situation with your colleagues at work? Oh uh, yeah, I was up front with them right from the get go and they've been really good. They also, a partner at the same firm, he dealt with his own, it wasn't colon cancer, but it was another type of cancer. So they kind of mm -hmm. not knew what to expect, but they had been through something similar with someone they were close with. So that was, that's helped me, I think. Cause mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. not, it's not that they know what you're going through, but at the same time, they, nothing really surprises them. Not, not that much anyway. 
Yeah. So, so um, Dr. Cuthbert, I mean, this concept of sharing openly your diagnosis, your situation with others, uh, what's been your experience in terms of um, what I call creating a better situation for everybody? Yeah, I would say definitely that that's a very personal decision, I think. Um, you know, in again, from my clinical practice and my research, I it, there seems to be a spectrum and some people are very private and, and don't even share their diagnosis with their extended family members. Um, and other people are very open and they want um, not just support, but they just want people to, they just want to be open with people about what they're going through. Um, and some people are on the, is, it, you know, kind of far end of the spectrum where they want to share because they want to um, other people to know about colorectal cancer. They want other people to know the warning signs to get, you know, checked out and to get treatment. So I, I think that it's very personal um, and people have to kind of make their own decision about what fits best for them. But if you do have the mindset that you can share, then I think it does, um, you know, set up that um, in some ways it might make things a bit easier. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Xavier, what's uh, your, your experience in terms of, was there fear returning to work? I mean, how did you approach that? Yeah, I, uh, I was off for 18 months and actually I was, I was really worried about uh, going back to work, whether I was able to mm. do the work um whether my brain was still functioning in the way it was but also whether i would be able to main to be in a meeting for an hour and a half or two hours um so i i i i thought about it a lot i got support as well to think through this in terms of psychotherapy to figure out as a, you know is my fear uh founded and how do i how can i how can i ease back into work um so I got help and I think it really worked well. Eventually I went back to work um, part-time for a month and then full-time and it's been working really well. So it's been going really well. So um, it was more about conquering that fear um, and also learning tips of what I can do to manage, uh, you know, my day and bowel movements and stuff like that. And also myself getting the confidence that I, if I need to, just leave a meeting because I know I'm going to be out of pocket for the next 45 minutes, then I'll just do it because that's the reality of who I am now. So I think that, that those changes were uh, very important. But, uh, you know, from even last year, I was really fearful of, uh, of doing that. So. Mm -hmm. And what you, you've touched on a little bit, the issue of um, um, Dr. Cuthbert raised with brain fog. What was your experience with that? Is that, that? is that something that's small, medium, or large? Is it different for everybody? I, I think for me, it was more about my energy levels. And so sometimes you can really focus on something and it's you can do it and it's fine. And sometimes you're just really tired. And so the hybrid model that I'm on as well, those days when I'm, uh, when I'm working from home, if I need to take a nap, I'll take it even if it's 15 minutes uh, in between meetings. And then I feel so much better. And uh, I try to manage, you know, breaks in my days. And, and so I, I, I don't feel like I have brain fog, but I definitely feel like my energy levels need to be managed more closely, more tightly than they used to. And it might change, maybe it'll get better in a year or two, I don't know. But in the meantime, so I've learned to set proper boundaries with work um, and say, this is where it stops. And this is where my health comes first, um, which is something that's new for me, so. Yeah, new for many of us. I like how you framed a successful return to work. So maybe you can give us the two or three things that you really felt from your perspective drove your that, that concept of a successful return to work. What are the two or three things that you would say? I, I would say the first thing was, um, being, being comfortable setting those boundaries or being able to say, having the confidence that say, I'm not going to go, I'm not, I'm not going to go to that extra meeting if I don't need to, uh, because this is where my, I've tapped, I'm tapped out, you know, 
Um, so I, I think that's the big one. The second one was um, at some point it was just go for it. Like I could be fearful of going, going back to work, but at some point just go, go you got to try it and see if it works. And that was probably the best advice I got to say, just, just do it. Even if it's not a hundred percent, if you go, just start, start the journey, I guess. And then, uh, you know, as I go, I can see it from a month. I mean, like I said, I, I'm less than a year. Um, my last treatment was less than a year ago and, uh, my last surgery and I'm, I can see month to month an improvement. And I, that's also what I'm, I'm trying to measure. And so day to day, I can't really see a difference, but if I look at last month, like, oh, you know what, there's a big difference and there's a really improvement. So that's encouraging. Wow. Hmm. Dr. Cuthbert, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this with all the people that you see and help this concept of successful reentry. Um, what do you think some of the factors are? Um, I think definitely getting help, recognizing what it means to, uh, to, to be successful. So, and I think for some patients that's, uh, hard, harder than others. I think some people are, are very good at, um, recognizing what it is that they need to conquer. And so, for example, that kind of the fear and conquering that fear and how to do that. And if that's um, getting help from psycho psychotherapy or resources, or whether or not that, um, you know, um, taking up an extra life program and trying to find your energy that way, um, getting support from your family for uh, uh, help with managing your day or managing the other things in your life that take up your energy. So I think it's mm -hmm. um, figuring out what you need and really taking ownership of finding your help and your way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully said, and I and I like very much um, how Xavier had had suggested. You know, setting boundaries. That's taking ownership. Um, <clears throat> Hannah, I mean, you. I would love what I call a five-year perspective. I am sure that how you manage your post-treatment today is different from how you managed it a year out, two years out, three years out. So we'd love to hear more about your journey. Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, what I, what I really think is the most remarkable part of it is that, you know, at the very beginning, um, as Dr. Cuthbert said, there's a huge focus on, you know, recurrence. That's a major, major anxiety uh, that is very real, um, especially, you know, I, I know this for myself, but also from patients that we speak to daily, that this is a huge concern um, in the, you know, in that part of the survivorship. Um, and so I think, you know, five years, six years out, I, I, I'm less concerned because I've had more successful follow-ups. I've had, you know, better, um, I've had scans that have come out clean. I've had, you know, a handful of colonoscopies that have come up, um, clean. So you start to regain confidence in your body and that's a huge factor. Um, for me, you know, six years out, it's really a lot more existential than I ever, ever thought it would be. Um, it's, uh, it's really the emotional, um, fallout of, of all of it. It's taking, um, you know, taking stock of what happened when you're going through the treatments and even I'd say one, two, even three years post, uh, it's almost like there's this protective film over your brain, over your mind, that um, that doesn't want to sort of release all of it at the same time. You know, it wants your body to recover, and then you know you start to sort of process what happened and how it's impacted you, how it's impacted the people around you, and you know, as Dr. Cuthbert was talking about, the impact on relationships and the impact on you know, your network around you. So, so that's sort of what I'm, you know, experiencing a lot more of and taking stock of 
what's important now. Uh, my values have changed. My perspectives on life have changed. Um, I, I was I was pretty shocked about how deeply this all kind of impacted me uh, mm. in that way. Mm. So there's something here on what I call the emotional challenges that you faced versus the physical challenges. Is there, um, does one supersede the other? Uh, is one more important than the other? And I'd like to understand that from the other panelists as well, but Hannah, I'll leave it with you, is you've spoken so beautifully just about all of the emotional impact, not so much about the phys physical management of things. So does one get bigger over time? So yeah, you know, initially um, it, took, it took quite a while, I'd say, the better part of a year, if not a little more, for my body to kind of release the toxins of the chemotherapy and sort of for my, you know, my bowels to kind of get in check a little bit after surgery. And, um, you know, then I had my port removed a year later. So there were a lot of physical things that went on. Um, the, I, I still have neuropathy, a little bit of neuropathy from the chemotherapy. Um, but certainly I've just become, you know, a lot more adept at dealing with it. I, I know that my fine motor skills are a little poor, but, you know, I compensate as best as possible. Um, but really, uh, at this point, yeah, I would have to say that the physical for me is less of a concern. Um, it's, it's really sort of the emotional impact and how that's kind of played out over the last six years. Yeah. Um, Ryan, I, I'm wondering if we could ask you to comment um, from somebody who was on life support to where you are today. Um, this question around you know, the management of the physical um, impacts versus the emotional impacts, what, what, how was that for you? Yeah, <clears throat> for me at this point, it's mostly been physical. I haven't, I don't know, haven't had time to worry about the emotional part, but it's definitely just you might be able to notice my voice kind of cuts in and out sometimes that's from the respirator like i don't have my voice isn't nearly as strong as it used to be and mm -hmm. i'll probably have to deal with that for quite a while yet but it's definitely been more the physical part especially mm -hmm. when you first get home and you know i had a walker i didn't, never thought i'd have a walker especially in my 40s but getting used to that sort of thing and i made sure I got rid of that thing pretty quick. I wasn't using a walker very long, but just have to right. listen to the physio and it eventually you get over it, but it's still mostly physical. No. Mm -hmm. That's not to mm -hmm. say there isn't some emotional, well, definitely an emotional toll, especially getting used to, or trying to go back to the things you did with, especially with my kids and wife before, like that, that doesn't just happen, so. Definitely, it's yeah. taken quite a while, but. Mm -hmm. But it must have taken amazing emotional strength to be able to take steps towards, quote unquote, a new normal, if I could use the words that Dr. Uh, Cuthbert has used here. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm definitely a pretty stubborn person, so I decided I wasn't mm -hmm. having any of that for very long. So I was gonna Good. get through it and get back to the way or try to get back to the way things were as much as possible. And mm -hmm. I think it's the one time my stubbornness has kind of been beneficial, but it's not always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> Xavier, uh, uh, how has that been for you? The balance of emotional and physical, especially at about an 18 yeah. month point, you certainly sound like you just took charge of it. I, I think I was lucky to not have too, ma too many physical, um, you know, that I'm not dealing with very, very difficult physical symptoms now. So um, I would say most of, I, I guess once that's, that probably is the thing that, that, you know, that you stop at first is the physical, but once that you feel that's the way it's in check, mm -hmm. I started looking at the emotional landscape and it was really, <laughs> it was not messy, but it's like a lot of work needed to be done. And what uh, Hannah was talking about, about like your, your, your purpose, your perspective and stuff like that. I would say the other part of the emotional journey is not just, um, it's not once and done, is it, it kind of hits me it hits me by surprise sometimes, you know, like it's, um, 
it's like, oh, I feel like, okay, I got, I, I'm good, I'm feeling great, and then boom, I think about something and then it brings me back. And the other part is that um, we, we have to think about the emotional journey of our, our caregivers or families. Um, I know um, for them, they're on, different, this, they're, they're on different wavelengths because they're not feeling the physical or even the medical journey in the same way that you do. And so I know that, for example, when I had my last surgery, I was like, oh, we're feeling all giddy and happy and ready to go. And, you know, that lasted for a few months, but my family wasn't with me. They were still worried about me. They were still, you know, and it, it, took, it took a long time. And I have teenagers at home, so they're also on a different emotional journey. So it, it was a bit of a, um, of a complicated cocktail at home. And so we had to go through that as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just me as a patient, but also as all the people around me, you were talking earlier about, you know, have your you know, but changing friends and, and I don't think I've done too much of that, but I think definitely the relationship with my direct family has been, is, is different now. And I know I have to take care of their emotional journey as well, or at least support them in their journey. Yeah, thank you. And I want to explore a little bit more about that. I want to go first back to Dr. Cuthbert and, and ask a, a rather basic question is, in, in your experience, uh, do, do most patients who are in, in recovery post-treatment seek psychotherapy? Is that common? Um, should it be more common? What are steps people could do, should do um, towards embracing what is clearly uh, 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 the many, many emotional issues that arise in post-treatment? Yeah, I would say that's a really good question. I would say it's, um, I don't know if we actually have good research to um, kind of, or statistics to tell us how many patients um, seek that type of support post-treatment. Um, in my experience, I would say it's an underutilized resource for sure. Um, and I think that's largely, well, probably for a lot of reasons, but patients are dealing with so many different things at the same time, as we just heard from our panel members, those kind of physical symptoms and dealing with the physical stuff, I think is in some ways is a bit easier because it's very um, clear to everyone around you what it is that you're trying to deal with. And it's very clear to you, you know, uh, for example, Ryan that was having trouble walking, it's very clear, okay, well, I just need to go to physio and, um, and do all the exercises and then my walking will hopefully get better. But I think the emotional, um, existential, social, that piece of it is, um, it's not as clear how to, to manage that. Um, it's not as clear to other people that what you're dealing with. And so I don't know if that's one of the reasons why it's, um, it's um, kind of left to the back burner for a while. And that's very common um, mm -hmm. and, um, again, it definitely is an, um, an underutilized resource that's usually available for people for free um, in most cancer care organizations. And um, I think it's something that um, once patients do kind of get on that train of looking for resources and help though, they usually find so many other things that are available that um, they want to take up as I mentioned before, exercise and meditation and art therapy. And so they kind of they kind of open the door and they realize, oh, there's all these things that can help me. And then usually those people are the ones that end up kind of, you know, trying a lot of the different things and finding so many kind of um, different areas that that are helpful that they would have never done before. So mm -hmm. and is it fair to say that all these resources are available in the um, care facilities, the treatment centers that many patients are um, visiting? Yeah, so I think that, again, we don't know that. And, um, or I don't know that. Um, a lot of cancer care organizations definitely have free resources for most patients. I think, you know, rural and remote communities are probably underserved. And, um, but there's also, you know, um, Canadian Cancer Society, Rectal Cancer Canada, 
um, wellspring. So there are a lot of things out there. The harder thing is patients don't know how to lose a lot, a lot of things. Yes. Yes. So I, I don't hear from the panel members how they went about finding those resources. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, thank you for saying it that way, uh, Javier. Please. Um. Yeah, uh, the day, the first day of my first appointment at the hospital with my oncologist, going into five months of uh, chemotherapy, I met a social worker, and um, she, I was able to talk to her, and I said. I know I need someone to talk to someone and I know my family needs to talk to someone. And so she had recommendations to those patient support organizations uh, like uh, Gilda's Club and Wellspring and, and so on, but also to um, therapists through the hospital as well. So I was able to, offer, through that, I was able to offer um, to all of my family members if they wanted uh, someone to talk to. And uh, mm -hmm. from day one, and. Uh, you know, it's it's gone. It's worked for some. It hasn't worked for others of the five of us. But uh, I think it's really helped those who needed it. Um, and then and once you have the experience of doing it with someone, then you can decide whether it's, that's what you want or pick maybe be more selective or more um, uh, more pointed as to what you need. But uh, mm -hmm. that's the way I went about it. So from day one, if you can, if you the, the hospital should be offering this service through a social worker. If they don't, you, you should ask for it. And they most, I think they all have it. Thank you for reinforcing that. Uh, Ryan, what has been your experience in accessing resources either for yourself or for your um, caregivers, your family? It was similar as Xavier. It was, we spoke to a social worker right after I found out. My biggest mm -hmm. worry was telling the kids because they were 11 and eight at the time. So I think the best way to go about telling your kids and how, how they might react, because we didn't really know, but so that was, we spoke to a social worker. My wife and I met with them, with the social worker and kind of just bombarded them with different questions of what we can expect and that sort of thing. We went through all that and told both kids and it was kind of like, eh, that sucks. And they, they seemed to deal with it better than we did, to be honest, but their kids are pretty resilient. But at the time, it was something we were very concerned about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I've been saving you for last because um, many of you know that in many ways, this is what Hana does, and she does it brilliantly um, for colorectal cancer Canada. So, you know, your advice, um, share Hana with, um, how, how do people get the resources they need? There's a lot of things around. What was your experience? So my experience, um, was not as positive, unfortunately, as Xavier and Ryan. Um, and, and I, you know, working for colorectal cancer canada and patient support um that's my goal is really to make things more accessible uh we recognize that the um you know these cancer care institutions and hospitals are inundated and that you know they lack resources and uh i was personally told well you know the social worker who I actually went to school with I did, we did our degree together um you know was really available pretty much for inpatients not for outpatients um you know i was i was offered uh, the services of a psychologist who I met with a few times, uh, as Ryan mentioned, you know, my biggest concern was how do I talk to the kids? What do I say? What don't I say? So, you know, really like I draw upon those experiences, those early experiences of mine to help um, really figure out with our team at CCC, you know, where are the gaps? What's missing? What don't patients uh, potentially have access to? How do we get 
what's our entry point to get patients to know that we have virtual support groups for various um, aspects of the journey, uh, that we have, you know, all sorts of educational materials and presentations and webinars to educate and empower patients and caregivers. So, um, you know, again, my, my experience really colors the work that I do. And, um, and that's really sort of how I approach my, my position at this point. Mm -hmm. And if you'll allow me, we, we uh, this conference, uh, Hannah and one of her colleagues, Iris, will be speaking on exactly this subject on day two of this uh, community conference to share uh, the vast number of resources that are available through colorectal cancer in the community in general to uh, people uh, who are going through uh, their cancer journey. Um, Dr. Cuthbert, I wanted to bridge back to an important conversation that you, you, you briefly touched upon and to hear the panel's experiences with this as well and this concept of what I call changing relationships. The idea is that not just cancer changes you, it can, can change relationships what, that you have with others, with it, whether it's your family, your friends, et cetera. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then I'd like to hear from the panelists on what they experienced or in fact not. Yeah, I think um, it's a really good topic because we've heard from patients in our research that um, I think there's a reevaluation of your life. And um, it's you start to um, really recognize what's important and what's not important. And really reevaluate um, what it is you want your life to look like going forward. And so part of that is definitely reevaluating relationships. And, um, you know, you want people around you that are going to be a good source of support and love and friendship in your life. Um, and the people that um, that weren't then you you need to reevaluate that. And so I think in our research, we definitely heard that um, people really, at some point along this kind of post-treatment trajectory, people really evaluate all aspects of their lives. Um, and that's one of the maybe positive things about having a diagnosis and one of the people things that people highlight as a positive aspect of having of being diagnosed is the chance to really kind of take stock in your life and your relationships and how people go about doing that i think is very different and when that occurs again i think is very different um, but a lot of times it's through um, things like um, you know psychosocial support and um, counseling um, support groups i think a lot of people find um, helping support groups and having talking to other people that have gone through cancer to understand how you've gone through that process. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, Xavier, could, could you comment on that? Is um, Was there relationships yeah. that evolved, changed, went away for you? Yeah, I think that for me, it wasn't necessarily the relationships first. It was more the boundaries or the energy like I was talking about is more the change of perspective and where do I want to spend my time um, knowing that my time is limited in a day and you know limited in now year <laughs> in many years so um, I, I for me it was more how do I spend and so then you know that I mean for sure what um, Do Dr. Kaffberg mentioned that, that really is happening. I, th I don't know that will ever be there be an end to it, but I think changing the way I think about things, how I approach things, and um, uh, try, I'm really trying to be more pur purposeful about w what I do. And um, in some ways, I'm much more patient and, and learn to kind of enjoy the time. And in other ways, I'm very not patient with when my time is wasted. And so it's kind of like, a, I'm not sure how, if I found it, so a final conclusion on this, but I, I, for sure it's been the, the, the this, this experience in the last two and a half years has been a trigger on rethinking all of that. And so if there is a positive is that it, 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 I did it now 
um, in my 40s and not later. But uh, yeah, that, I would say it's changed a lot. And so maybe the relationships themselves have changed as a, as a, but it hasn't been the primary driver of this or that person. It's more, where is my energy best spent? Yeah, yeah. So a relationship with self, that's beautifully said. Um, Ryan, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so I, I haven't found that relationships have changed too much for me, like some more from maybe more superficial friends, you kind of realize who some people just don't want to talk about it. They don't, you know, you just kind of carry on. But I find as far as people that are close to me, I, I haven't found things change too much that way. Now, whether they think I've changed, probably, that's probably a different question, but mm -hmm. I, and I definitely have, they would be, I think it'd be a miss to think you didn't, but it's definitely, it's been, I haven't found that part to be too difficult, but mm -hmm. maybe I'm mm -hmm. missing something too. Mm -hmm. Who knows? <laughs> I doubt you're missing anything, but uh, you're oh, also you. at a at a, a different uh, part of your journey. So, Anya, again, you've got five years, six years of perspective around this. And uh, what would you offer on the subject of changing relationships, evolving relationships? So I think, um, you know, for me, um, the, the, the thing I'd like to first highlight is uh, how it impacted my kids. Um, you know, my little one was too, too young when I was done with treatment, she was five, but the older one was seven. And, you know, um, again, a huge balance in terms of what do I tell them? What don't I tell them? Um, I, I would come home with the infusion bottle. So they were very, you know, she was clearly very well aware, um, that I was getting this stuff, um, this medicine mm -hmm. to help me. But, um, you know, it was an interesting reaction from her. She's a very intelligent, emotionally intelligent kid. Um, and when this was all done, I never used the word cancer, which, you know, may have been a mistake. Uh, I was, I was uh, advised against it, but, um, <laughs> but, but I didn't because they had learned about Terry Fox and the that was the only cancer experience they had. And they knew he died of the cancer. So to me, it was like, if I tell them that I have cancer, they're going to think I'm done. Um, and then, you know, one day she pointedly asked me, you know, do you have cancer? And I was caught in the headlights and I just kind of said, yes. And um, we went through an interesting period of about two years where she said, mommy, I just don't trust you. So it was, it was actually, that really changed the nature of our relationship. Um, you know, we had to have talks about uh, openness and communication, uh, you know, with a seven, eight, nine year old, which was very interesting. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that it really strengthened the relationship uh, with her and, and you know, uh, secondarily with, with my other daughter. Um, as far as, you know, other relationships, like I'm somebody who's, very, who's always needed to feel connected to people um, that I'm close with. And uh, I think that only got stronger. Um, there was a sort of, um, it's almost like this weird, uh, your body returns to nature. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I felt, and I still feel very connected to, sort of the environment around me. Um, and I and I really feel either very connected to people or I don't. And I used to kind of, you know, as a social worker, you're kind of this social being and you're kind of just open to everybody and whatever. But um, I'm, I'm going to echo what Xavier said, which is, you know, I kind of have less patience for things that just don't connect to me that way. Um, I, I know what's important to have in my life and close to me and what's really important to not, <laughs> um, you know, for my own personal and uh, emotional well-being. So I would say for me, that big word, you know, five, six years later is connectivity. Um, and so I need to feel connected to the work that I do and I need to feel connected to the people that I allow in my life. So that's How beautifully that's said. Kind of it is a gift. Thanks. Yeah, beautifully said. It is the gift, I think, of the circumstance 100%. In the last moments we have, I just would like to go around the panel and um, uh, ask you to make a very brief statement is that as you've had to step into, quote unquote, Dr. Cuthbert, I'm going to use your words, the new normal of uh, post um, post treatment stage of your life. What is the one thing that you can help 
our audience understand is the best way to be successful on that post-treatment journey? And Dr. Cuthbert, I'll start with you. Um, I would say just um, allow yourself to go through this however you need to, and don't feel like you need to fit into one trajectory or one box, um, and just have some self-compassion. Thank you. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, but I, I think it's more for me, it's just kind of the realization that, you know, right from the get go, I said I was going to beat it and that's it. And I just kept focused on that and I'm going to get back to the way I want things to be as much as I can. And I just always had that focus in my mind, but that worked for me. It's not going to work for everybody. That's for sure. Be a fighter. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Xavier. I think for me, um, when you're going, this is a session on post-treatment. So when you're going through treatment, you're kind of like a child in a way, and someone is always doing something for you. Here's the next treatment, here's the next thing. And then when you're done, you have a checkpoint every six months or 12 months or whatever it is. But you, there's no one, there's no, in the medical community doesn't have a lot of answers about how to manage this or that and and everybody has the experience is different and so you have to go and find it for, for yourself and so just realizing that actually post-treatment is there's a lot of work it all falls on you there's no one anymore to say this is your next treatment is on this date and you come show up now you're in charge and and that's not easy but uh that's the reality so um that's what i would say that's something we you know that i love your theme keep of mind i need to find that yeah personal ownership, you've, you've highlighted that. And Hannah, the last word goes to you. Um, I would say, you know, empowering yourself by finding, you know, your passions, they may have changed, find what, you, what you're passionate about and make sure that you include it in some way every single day. It gives your life purpose um, and, and meaning. Um, and I would say be flexible, as Dr. Cuthbert said, be kind to yourself. It's really important. There is no one script. There's no one way to do this. Um, and create that mindset that you know is going to work for you. And that might be a, that will be a tapestry of many, many different things, but keep an open mind to what that can be. Okay. Many thanks to Dr. Cuthbert, to Hannah, to Javier, and to Ryan. Uh, we're going to now open it up from to, uh, to questions from our audience at this stage that have been coming in. Hello. And in fact, we've got a lot of amazing questions coming in. Um, with um, unfortunately, uh, Xavier was unable to uh, attend and had to leave the session um, and could not stay around for the Q and A. However, we've got Ryan, Dr. Cuthbert, and Hannah with us, who are very happy, I know, to be able to answer the questions. We've got about ten minutes or so, and uh, I'm just going to get right into it because there's many of them right now. The first question is: In May of 2021, I completed my COPAX and still suffering with neuropathy in my hands and feet, constant pain in my hip, as well as side under both ribs with constant gas pain and brain fog and cancer-related fatigue. So certainly a lot of symptoms. I am currently in post-treatment. However, daily activities of life are hard to return to, and I'm wondering why it's taking so long to recover as it's been almost a year. Hannah, would you like to um, take this question? Um, certainly, I don't want to talk too much because I think Dr. Cuthbert could really uh, give us some, some really great insight here. Um, but I think uh, just from my experience personally and speaking to other patients, I think it really is patient dependent. Um, the treatments that you receive, uh, the way that your body kind of deals with that, uh, I think everybody has a has a different process. Uh, the brain fog for me lasted well past a year. I mean, we're six years 
forward and not to make anybody feel sort of frustrated or, or worried, but, you know, I still have a bit of word finding difficulties. My memory is not really what it was. Um, you know, the neuropathy does still have, you know, is still a part of it in my feet. Uh, so, so unfortunately these things, you know, often do remain for some people, they don't, but, um, but certainly uh, there are ways, there are different ways. Uh, I was lucky enough to have, it, have a bit of uh, post-cancer rehab. So I learned a little bit from the occupational therapist, different exercises to do to increase circulation, uh, which improved my finger, uh, nor the neuropathy in my fingers, um, different things like that. And I'll, I'll let Dr. Cuthbert uh, address it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Something that I think we hear commonly in clinical practice. And we know from the research that it is highly variable and that um, on average, a lot of the post-treatment symptoms seem to mostly go away if they're going to at the kind of two to three year mark. Um, however, there are some lasting effects that just for some people, don't ever resolve. And unfortunately, peripheral neuropathy is one of the ones that um, doesn't seem to completely resolve in some patients. So I would agree that um, finding cancer rehab, if that's available for you, or um, even things like exercise, meditation, um, have all been shown to help with some of these post-treatment um, problems. So I would encourage um, the person that asked the question, Karima, it looks like to, um, to look for those opportunities and also um, to be patient, although that's easy for me to say because I'm not the one that's dealing with it. Your body's been through a lot, so it's, it's going to take some time to recover for sure. Yeah, thank you. Is um, I, I like the point that Hannah made. Is every per person's different, but you know, setting appropriate expectations around time. How should people think about the post-recovery process? Does some recover six months? Is 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 there any kind of um, consistency that we can communicate around what is an appropriate amount of time to expect to to recover? Yeah, so again, I think from the research, we know that it's on average kind of, you know, 18 months to to two, two years on average. Um, but again, the um, expectation for some of the symptoms are that they may not ever completely resolve. Mm, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Cuthbert, this question is for you also. Is adjunctive chemotherapy necessary and is there any benefit to it in patients that have had a complete response during surgery? So that's a question that I think is probably most or best answered between yourself and your medical team, um, mostly because it's highly variable depending on your tumor type and your, um, your pathology. Um, and so, and I don't, certainly don't want to give anybody medical advice <laughs> on this forum. Um, so I would say um, that's probably best answered with your, your medical team. Okay, thank you very much. You know, the, the next question is related to brain fog and it came up certainly in the uh, first question as well, but this one's a little bit deeper. When speaking of brain fog, frog, I find I slur my words now. I repeat reading the same sentence in my novels and my train of thought just gets lost. I misplace things. And it's rather a cute comment here. Like I've, I've, I've placed ice cream in the refrigerator as opposed to the, re as opposed to the freezer. <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> so th this concept of brain fog clearly is common. I mean, uh, Ryan, did you experience it? What have others experienced in this space? And what are some of the things that we can do about it? Yeah, I think I did the ice cream thing before I had cancer, so <laughs> I'm not quite <laughs> sure. But yeah, definitely brain fog's been, been an issue and that was my main concern going back to work is am I going to be able to work like I did before? But I think it's as long as I take breaks and kind of, you know, don't push like I would have five years ago or whatever, but I think that's helped a lot. 
Yeah. Hannah, same thing. Um, yeah, no, I think it goes back to what uh, Xavier was saying um, during the panel discussion about setting boundaries. And I think it's incredibly important to strike a balance, especially after something like this. Uh, it's a life changing event and uh, everybody just wants to return to normal. But, you know, th there is such thing as the new normal. And this is, you know, you are not the same person. Um, that you were before this experience, it really changes you fundamentally in many, many ways. And um, and I think you know what Ryan's saying about um, you know taking rests and taking breaks. I mean, this helps with the brain fog. I find um, <clears throat> this this type of sort of. I found concentration was a, became a bit of an issue. It was very hard to focus on things. I would lose my focus very easily. Um, that has gotten better. Uh, partially because I've, I've gotten into more of a steady routine. I think, you know, trying to restart a routine as soon as possible, even if it's like, okay, in the morning, I'm going to go out for a walk and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to, you know, attend to some of my bills or whatever. But as long as you have some kind of routine that you're setting, your brain starts to kind of, you know, regenerate a little bit and you become a little bit more focused. So taking small, you know, making small goals for yourself and trying to achieve that and then moving on from there, I think is probably the best approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Cuthbert, any kind of, we'll call it medical advice that you, you would offer around brain fog? Well, I think just kind of the momisms I always call, I always say to people in clinical practice. So just all those important things like getting enough sleep, um, stress management, eating properly, all those um, kind of basic things are actually really important because we know a lot of brain fog is multifactorial. Part of it is fatigue. Part of it is stress. Part of it is just all the chemicals that have been through your system. And so all those kind of important, you know, healthy living aspects, exercise are all really important in helping to mitigate some of that brain fog. But again, some of it is just time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, do I just want to mention one more. I'm Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, go ahead. Please. I did want to just throw out um, something that people don't tend to talk about is that um, cancer or diagnosis and the treatment that follows is a trauma to the body and to the brain. Um, and this is a, a topic that, you know, we're going to be addressing, you know, uh, in the future at CCC, because this is a really important thing for people to understand that the post-trauma of cancer and the impact that it has on on people and that you know post traumatic stress is is you know is attributed to um, memory loss and a bunch of the different things that people are experiencing post treatment so i think it's important to work on processing what you've gone through as well to help move forward the cognitive redevelopment that's a, that's a wonderful addition, thank you. And I think it's a bridge to the final question that we have time for today. And it's around how do we deal with the fear of re recurrence of disease? Um, Ryan, do you wanna comment on that? Sure. Um, I don't know, I think it's, it's always gonna be there. I'm not, I don't, like early on when I found out I had cancer, I decided I was just gonna beat it and if it comes back I'll beat it again so <clears throat> that's kind of the mindset I have but and I realize that probably doesn't work for everybody but I just try not to mm -hmm. think too much about it and sorry my cat wants to be on, on TV <laughs> no don't apologize but... <laughs> I think cat is part of therapy <laughs> yeah but yeah no it's, it's just I try not to worry about it too much and trust in the doctors and I have my regular CAT scans and every, all the other monitoring. So just trust mm -hmm. that if it does come back, they'll find it early and we'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you like to have the final word on this one, Dr. Cuthbert? Actually, I was going to leave that to Hannah. I think she she probably might have a better um, We're looking forward to uh, the work that I'm, ha I'm happy to share it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Hannah. Have the last word. Um, I, I don't know that there's any one. Yeah, I don't know that there's any uh, one way to deal with it. I think that um, 
you know, honoring the fear is important, um, facing these things, talking about them, um, and then having that first scan. I mean, there's a reason why there's the term scanxiety. It exists. Uh, you go in for a scan and it brings you right back to that day of diagnosis where, you know, where you're going through that tunnel and you're hearing that voice and the whole bit. So, um, you know, you need to honor it and you need to talk it through. Uh, this is how we process things support groups. I know that we, you know, our support groups, our virtual support groups are really, really helpful for a lot of our patients. Uh, for me as well. I mean, as a moderator, as a, as a, you know, facilitator, I, it's helpful for me too, to talk things out. Uh, so don't isolate yourself. Um, give credence to how you're feeling. And this is the only way to kind of deal with it and get past it. And then with each scan and each successful appointment, you know, you build, you rebuild the confidence in your body. Of course, sometimes it does come back. And then as Ryan said, you deal with it in that moment. Okay, where are we going from here? And you get back into that head, head, you know, head space, but you need to build yourself back up physically and mentally before, you know, after, after you have these treatments. Yeah, thank you for thank you for saying that. And a reinforcement again on the wonderful resources that are available for Colorectal Cancer Canada um, that are available through this conference. Uh, simply go to the um, uh, click on the logo on the exhibit page and get into the resource portal. I want to thank Dr. Cuthbert, Brian, Hannah, of course. Uh, Javier, who was not here for a wonderful panel. And we've made it through the first half day.